Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. They make the show possible. Our discussion today is going to be about your gut, not your gut feeling, not your good sense of intuition, but about the microbiome that's living in your gut and how to make it healthier so you will be healthier. We're going to be talking to Robin Chutkin, Dr. Robin Chutkin, who has written a book called The Microbiome Solution, A Radical New Way to Heal Your Body from the inside out. Now, Dr. Chutkin is quite impressive. Uh, She is one of the most recognizable gastroenterologists working in the U.S. today. She is the author of Gut Bliss, and she has a B.S. from Yale, an M.D. from Columbia, and is a faculty member at Georgetown University Hospital. She is an avid snowboarder and a marathon runner. She practices yoga And uh, her dedication is really just to helping her patients live not just longer, but better. And so today she's going to teach us how to live longer and better, somewhat like the old Star Trek dictum of live long and prosper. Dr. Chutkin, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on today. Well, I tell you, that this, uh, this book is quite revolutionary, at least for me, because it's a new way of looking at health. And uh, so I want to dig into this uh, deeply so that uh, can understand, you know, what you have to offer here in a kind of new paradigm, at least for me. I know it may be common in the medical world, but it seems new to me. Is it new? It is very new, and it's new to me, too. As a physician, I'll tell you, I don't think 10 years ago any of us practicing medicine were familiar with the term microbiome. And, you know, it's one of these things that this is sort of the the trajectory we're seeing where, in some ways, a lay audience is more familiar with the microbiome because of the exposure in the popular press than the medical community, and also because it contradicts a lot of the things we were taught in medical school, namely that it's better to be clean than dirty, and the cleaner we are, the healthier we are, and antibiotics are great. So it, it really turns a lot of that on its head, and for that reason, I think there's been a little bit of slow acceptance in the medical community about the importance of this stuff. Well, you have an interesting statement in here that I want you to elaborate on, because I read it to my wife and it freaked her out. <laughs> where you said uh, to eat clean and live dirty. So explain that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So eat clean means really, it's sort of the opposite of what it sounds like. It really means eating food that is not grown with pesticides and chemicals and that's mm-hmm. actually grown in soil as opposed to assembled in a factory. So um, eat clean kind of means eating food with some dirt on it or that had some dirt in it at one point. Mm-hmm. But I think we're, we're mostly familiar with that concept of clean eating, mm-hmm. not eating uh, food with a lot of chemicals in it. But live dirty is, is maybe a little bit newer to many of us. And again, this is the idea that we need exposure to germs and bacteria and dirt in order to be healthy. And the main reason we need that is that our immune system needs it to be trained. So early on when our siblings cough and sneeze on us and we get a cold and we, you know, we come home from school with all these, these different illnesses, our immune system gets stronger each time it gets exposed to these things. And more importantly, it gets trained so that later on it knows the difference between a harmless bacteria virus that it can ignore versus something that it needs to really mount a reaction to. What we're finding is that children who grow up in the developed world in Western Europe and North America and so on, where there's less exposure to childhood illnesses and there's way more antibiotic and and, uh, hand sanitizer use, is that this leads to a little bit of confusion on the part of the immune system later on where the immune system can then overreact to things and lo and behold, we have autoimmune diseases. So this is the basis of what we call the hygiene hypothesis which was something that David Strawn, a lecturer at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, uh, stumbled upon in his research. He was tasked with finding out why they were seeing skyrocketing rates of hay fever and eczema in post-industrial London when everyone had left the farm and gone to the factory. (laughs) And he, he made two startling observations. He found that, number one, kids from families that had a lot of siblings had much lower rates of these conditions, 
And number two, kids from more affluent families where they had higher standards of hygiene had higher rates. So it was good to be in a large family where your siblings were sneezing and coughing on you. (laughs) And it was good, at least in those times, to be poorer and to not be washing and scrubbing and, you know, kind of eradicating your microbiome all the time. And this stands true today. If we look at a map of the world, we see very high rates of autoimmune diseases in Western Europe, North America, and so on and very low rates in the developing world. And as countries become more industrialized and there's more chlorine in the water, more antibiotics and so on, more processed food, we see increasing rates. We've seen that a lot in the Middle East and India where diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis that were virtually unheard of a few decades ago are now really on the rise. Well, that's so interesting and it's so different, like you pointed out, from what we have been taught is to be keep our children exceptionally clean and keep them away from other kids who have colds and flu and that sort of thing and to keep the house immaculate so that they won't be exposed to dust and that sort of thing. And so what you're saying is somewhat, not totally the opposite. I mean, I guess you don't want to live in a filthy environment, but... Uh, no, no, but, no. But to be obsessive is to actually reduce the immune system's ability to generate a, a healthiness. That's exactly right. And again, it's a great idea if, you know, a neighbor's kid has a flu to keep your kid away. I mean, we don't want to intentionally sure. visit things like uh, the flu or strep on our kids, but the occasional viral illness is really what I'm talking about, and that is, is essential, essentially. Well, it, it, you, you know, you remind me of that... Um, a classic medical story about the milkmaids in in Europe who were immune to smallpox because yes. they did the dirty work of milking cows and were exposed to cowpox, right? That's exactly right, and it protected them. Mm-hmm. And so they they were living the <laughs> the, they the were tough and dirty, dirty life, <laughs> and it it helped them. And actually, now is there any truth to this? I've I've had friends who've. Uh, uh, traveled around the world and they've had tough jobs in Peace Corps, military, whatever, and they lived in really uh, tough environments. And they claim, uh, some of them, they say, uh, ever since I, you know, worked uh, a year in Africa, I've been enormously healthy. Absolutely, because the colonization with, uh, you know, a wide variety of different bacteria can actually make your GI tract much hardier and more resistant to infection. It's the same thing. It's the same concept that we were discussing earlier, that if you don't have a wide array, sort of high diversity of species and enough different kinds and high enough numbers, it makes you more susceptible to illness. And, you know, what's really interesting when we think about communicable diseases like a common cold and so on, is that we all know people who are never sick, no matter what. Everybody has a flu, they're fine. And we all know people who are sick all the time. And this is not a matter of exposure. It's not that the person who's never sick is never exposed to somebody with strep or the flu, or the person who's sick all the time is constantly exposed. It has to do with their immunity and susceptibility. And that has a lot to do with things like how many antibiotics you've taken in the past, what kind of diet you eat, whether you've lived in the developing world and maybe have gotten colonized with some hardy strains. So it, it is much more about what your background noise is of your microbiome than whether you come into contact with something or not. And these days when, you know, there's so much scary stuff floating around from flesh-eating bacteria to Zika, it's important to really pay attention to this because to some extent you, you can't really hide from this stuff. After a while, it's everywhere. But what you can do is you can strengthen your immune system by avoiding antibiotics, by exposing yourself to nature and the elements, by eating a healthy diet full of plants. These are things that can really strengthen your immune system. So if I'm eating beef that has been raised with uh, antibiotics, or chicken for that matter, which we know is very common in the industry, do those antibiotics pass through me and damage my microbiome? They absolutely can. They mm-hmm. absolutely can. And they can, you know, we know that 80% of all the antibiotics sold in the U.S. are used in the food industry, in the animal industry. That's shocking. It is so that shocking. means even, even if you're a really concerned parent and you're very judicious about avoiding antibiotics, if you're not paying attention to what your kid is eating, they are getting antibiotics that way. And they can, the antibiotics that we ingest 
through the animal industry can induce resistance. I mean, we're having a huge problem in the U.S. now with the resistant superbugs, and a lot of that is because they use the same antibiotics in the animal industry as, as people are prescribing, as physicians are prescribing in their offices. In Europe, they've had a little bit more of a sensible approach in many countries, and they have outlawed certain antibiotics and said you can't use this in the animal industry. But in the U.S., there's very little transparency. We don't even know which antibiotics are being used. We don't know in what quantities and so on. So we have a long ways to go there. Well, you are right now a a, uh, practicing uh, internist, right, gastroenterologist. That's right. Right. I said internist. That's come my generic term. (laughs) Well, we we have to do internal medicine (laughs) before we do gastroenterology. So, So it's true also. So... Let me get a free consultation. If I were to come to you, and I'm I'm a fairly healthy person, which I am, and I wanted to improve my microbiome, do you have a pill that you can give me that will give me the the good bacteria I need, or do I get it through eating? Well, I I do, but even before that, I would ask you a series of questions, including whether you were born by a C-section, whether you were breastfed Mm -hmm. or not, I'd ask you about your antibiotic use in early childhood and adulthood, um, any infections you had, where you've lived, what you've eaten, and on and on and on, medications you've taken. And then I would give you a little kit called Ubiome, uh, which is a company in California that does next generation sequencing of the DNA in stool to tell us what you're growing there. Mm -hmm. I'd give you this little kit to take home. You would swab the toilet paper after a bowel movement. You don't actually have to collect stool, which is always nice. And then you would send that off, and then they would send us back the results. So I would be able to tell you what the diversity of species in your microbiome is. I would be able to tell you what the large families are, and there are four main ones in humans. There's Bacteroidetes, Firmicutes, Actinobacteria, and Proteobacteria. And I would be able to make some assumptions based on the percentages of and the kind of ratio between those four. And then... The first thing I would tell you, if there's some microbial discord, is to eat more vegetables. <laughs> but I would probably also, it does, you know, people always want some super kind of sexy new advice. And I'm like, I'm so sorry to tell you that you need to eat more vegetables. <laughs> Your mother was right. But I would also, I would also likely, particularly if you had Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and mm-hmm. autoimmune disease, or if you had some gas or bloating, mm-hmm. or if your microbiome was not looking so great, I would also probably use a probiotic. We use a couple different ones. There's a prescription strength one that we use that has 900 billion live bacteria of eight different strains. Um, Wow. And the 900 billion is the number of colony-forming units. And that one, in, in several studies, was shown to be equivalent to some of the prescription medications that we use for ulcerative colitis. So it's a very potent probiotic, and the strains all work synergistically. And so I might use that very, that's sort of the most robust one on the market, or I might use something different if you were coming to see me and you'd had a bout of traveler's diarrhea. I might give you a two or three strain probiotic at a lower amount. So it really depends on what we're trying to fix and the level of microbial discord that we're seeing. Well, tell me one of your success stories. A patient comes with, uh, presents with certain symptoms and you did what to fix them? It's really, you know, probiotics, diet, and lifestyle, and it is so rewarding. The biggest group of patients that we treat are patients who have autoimmune diseases who went, who want to get off immune-modulating drugs. So drugs like steroids and biologics, those drugs can be helpful. They dampen down the immune system, but they're not without risk, as you know, including risk of serious infection, risk of cancer when it comes to the biologics. So people are aware of this, and they often they, they want the disease to be in remission. They want to feel better, but they want to do it without putting themselves at risk in terms of developing other conditions. And so we have a couple strict dietary protocols that we use for our patients who have serious autoimmune disease. And the most gratifying thing for me, Bill, is when somebody comes in and they're on this long laundry list of medications and we can not only get them off the medications, but get them feeling better. Because not only do you feel like you've kind of pulled them from the clutches of pharmaceutical misadventure, but more importantly, you've validated this idea that we very much are in control of our own health. I think the medical community has done a fantastic job of disconnecting that for us <laughs> and making we think that we're, we're not and disease just falls out of the sky and there's nothing you can do but take a pill. Mm-hmm. But we are very much in control. I mean, yes, there are some environmental factors we're not aware of and there's some genetic predispositions and sometimes illness does fall out of the sky, but that's the exception, not the norm. So 
being able to to sort of validate for people that there are things that they can do themselves to improve their health in this quite dramatic way. I mean, being able to get an autoimmune disease into remission using diet and lifestyle is, is not an easy thing to do, but it's doable. And when people are dedicated, they can do it. And, you know, my office is full of those success stories. The internet is full of those success stories. And, and it's really sort of a revolution in healthcare that we're seeing where people are realizing that they can advocate for their own health and they can control what happens to them by controlling what they're doing. If I go to the grocery store and I buy that yogurt with the probiotic in it, is is that useful? That's a waste of time. <laughs> I mean, it's I, and keep in mind that a lot of the yogurts out there have upwards of twenty grams of sugar, mm-hmm. which is very similar to what a serving of Haagen Dazs has. So a lot of the ice cream, that, uh, a lot of the ice cream, Freudian slip, a lot of the yogurt <laughs> that you're eating resembles ice cream uh. in its, you know, in terms of its ingredients. And most of them don't have enough bacteria. There's a lot of marketing, but there's not enough live bacteria in most commercial yogurts to really accomplish anything in somebody who's really looking to make a change. So um, you'd be better off going and getting some sauerkraut and pickles and kimchi if they sell it at your supermarket and um, and going to the produce section and getting you know some leeks and celery and asparagus and stuff like that but fermented foods are particularly good because not only are they providing fiber to feed your existing gut bacteria but in the fermentation process and for something like sauerkraut where we essentially just putting cabbage and salt water and letting it ferment, there's a tremendous amount of lactobacillus that's produced, which is one of the main species, uh, main families in the gut that's very helpful. And so it's a little bit of a twofer. Not only are you getting the fiber, but you're also getting actual live bacteria to add to your to your microbiome. Well, let's get down to what's really important. Is beer helpful? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> it's a fermented food, uh, but... Um, no. It doesn't seem to really, I'm so, That's so sorry, sad, it doesn't yeah. seem to, to really help too much. I mean, it doesn't necessarily hurt if you tolerate gluten and, you know, hops or gluten-containing yeah. grains. So if you tolerate it, I, I think a little bit is fine. But, you know, this is a sad truth. Before there were antibiotics, what was our main antiseptic? It was alcohol. That was what we used to clean the operating rooms and hospitals. That's still what we swab on our skin before we get blood drawn. So alcohol kills microbes. (laughs) But a little bit is fine. In moderation, it's fine. I read once that uh, in Europe, in the kind of Middle Ages, that, uh, you know, beer was consumed more than water, and it was probably best because you would... You would die of a waterborne illness yeah, faster you'd die from than cholera. you. <laughs> faster oh yeah, you'd they die drank of... ale. <laughs> yes. They drank ale, bread and ale, and in fact, kids drank ale mm-hmm. because, for that reason, that you know, before, I mean, as much as you, we can criticize uh, modern sanitary practices and so on and say we should all be dirty. The truth is that putting putting chlorine in the water really put an end to things like cholera, waterborne illnesses Mm -hmm. like that, that devastated communities. But unfortunately, it's killed off the healthy bacteria, too. And somebody suggested to me that maybe we should be putting probiotics in the water, the way they put fluoride in the water. And that's not a bad Mm -hmm. idea, although the chloride might kill it. You can actually get whole house chlorine filters as well as charcoal filters that can filter out the chlorine for your shower head. So if you have concerns about the water supply, there are filters that you can put in that that will help. Some of the statements you make in the book have been very um, surprising to me, and uh, I always like things that uh, give me, uh, you know, kind of turn my head around and say, can that be true? And like one of these statements that uh, that you made was that the microbiome identifies you, your microbiome identifies you with greater accuracy than your DNA. It does, indeed, and that's because our microbial cells outnumber human cells about 10 to 1. We have uh, many more microbial cells than human cells. So this microbial footprint is really an indicator. It, it tells us everything about you, again, whether you were born, how you were born, whether C-section, vaginally, whether mm-hmm. you breastfed, what you've eaten, where you've lived, infections, hormones, medications, all of that, whether your sister sneezed on you. <laughs> so it, it is more unique than your own DNA. That's, that's quite astounding when you think about it. Has this been used in court? 
not yet, I think. And, you know, like the DNA analysis, it mm-hmm. will be fraught with error, too, human error mm-hmm. and otherwise. Right. But it is an intriguing possibility that we would be able to look at microbial fingerprints down the road. So you would be able to identify, for instance, if, let's suppose, just a crazy idea, that uh, in order for per- for a person to have committed a given murder, they, they have to have uh, they, they must uh, have been in South America, you know, at some point. Could they prove through the microbiome that they were there? Oh, gosh, that's such an intriguing idea, this sort of forensic microbiology. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we can pinpoint it, but for sure there's a camera somewhere. That's caught <laughs> but, you know, we can predict obesity with uh, 95% accuracy by wow. looking at the microbiome. Wow. Because we do know the microbial footprint, if you will. We, we know a little bit about what an obese microbiome looks like, if you will. Now, there's a lot of overlap because we can see microbial discord from other things that can cause us, but we see low species diversity and a high ratio of this class of bacteria called Formicutes. You know, we talked about the the different phyla or families of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And that's because Formicutes, historically through, you know, millennia ago, are better at storing fat. And so people who lived in northern climates where there were long, cold winters developed higher numbers of formicutes so they could store fat that could be mobilized through the winter when, when food wasn't so readily available. So there's a little bit of that also just with people of sort of northern European ancestry. So, you know, it, there's sort of adaptation on the part of our microbes that we see that overlaps a little bit with some of these more disease states, if you will. Well, everybody's always wanting to lose weight, it seems. Can you use micro- the microbiome to lose weight? We can use the microbiome to gain weight, <laughs> but the reverse <laughs> doesn't seem quite as easy. So there have been a lot of experiments where they've taken microbes from lean mice or from obese mice. So the classic one is you take microbes from an obese mouse and you transplant them to a germ-free mouse, and lo and behold, that mouse starts to gain weight without any change in diet. The reverse doesn't seem to be as easy. A a part of this is that microbes can change what's called the energy harvest of the food we eat, which basically amounts to the amount of calories extracted. They can speed up or slow down transit through the digestive tract. They can kind of rearrange a taste bud so certain foods are more appealing. They can consume calories themselves so that there are less calories available to get stored as fat. And um, we, we do see that within the same, if you give... 2,000 calories of exactly the same food to do two different people who have very different microbiomes, the amount of calories they extract will be different. And we have seen that in identical twins where one is lean and the other is obese, but they have profound changes in the microbiome that we think are responsible for how they metabolize the food differently. So it's intriguing. We're not at the point yet. I think we're quite far from it where we can give a probiotic or a specific strain of bacteria But we are identifying some of these differences. There's a bacteria called Kristen senilacea, which is associated with leanness, and it seems to be inherited. And so people who are colonized with more Kristen senilacea will gain less weight for the same amount of food. The the problem is, Bill, that at the end of the day, it's still about what you feed those microbes. So if I could gather up a whole bunch of Kristen senilacea and ingest them, in order for them to stay alive, I would have to be feeding them, mm. guess what, eat more plants. <laughs> so <laughs> more plants. Still, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no way to, you know, kind of eat ice cream and fried chicken mm. and chocolate and um, stay slim in the real world. It just doesn't that's seem to just be so, possible just yet. That's <laughs> so cruel of nature to make that so... <laughs> One of the, I know you have to go in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to make everyone aware that you have a splendid number of recipes in the book. And unlike many books that have recipes, which are generally unappealing and, uh, in fact, gross, uh, these are <laughs> these are quite these attractive. Are yeah, yes. they're great. These I, are good. I've had them all, and they're very good. I very like tasty. your baked avocado with egg. That sounds oh, like a good you. breakfast, you know. Fruity yeah. oats, and I can eat that, you know. That's, this is good. <laughs> I didn't see any barbecue in here, though. There's no barbecue, uh-huh. but there's some good grain-free pancakes that are fantastic. <laughs> in fact, there's an egg and banana one that's super easy to mm-hmm. make. So all of these uh, recipes will help us uh, improve our microbiome, right? Absolutely. Good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to write to you in a year and tell you how healthy I am. 
Fantastic. Well, you sound like you were healthy to begin with, <laughs> well, so thank you're just you. going to be even healthier. Yeah, well, that's be great. That's my hope. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful book. Like I said, I enjoy books that give me a, a fresh perspective on anything, the world, health, politics, and this does that. And so I recommend it to everybody as a, as a new way of looking at your health. Thank you so much. Best of luck. Enjoy your, I know you have a lot of interviews today, so uh, I'll let you go. But thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you for having yeah. me. We've been talking today to Dr. Robin Chutkin concerning her new book, The Microbiome Solution, A Radical New Way to Heal Your Body from the Inside Out. It is a splendid book, and I highly recommend it. It has, as we pointed out, a great number of healthy recipes in the back that you'll want to get hold of. And it has a chapter that we didn't get to discuss, a little bit indelicate, but it's called Stool Transplants. And you will want to get the book just to learn all about that and how it can actually be useful. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs> <laughs>